Welcome back. Um, I haven't actually made one of these videos in a while, so I'm actually looking forward to this. Um, recently in my classes, we've uh, the class got basically through the TCA cycle, so I'm actually going back and making some videos on gluconeogenesis. Now, um, in a separate video, we'll actually look at the mechanism of gluconeogenesis and how it works. What I want to do in this video is talk about a very important enzyme to that process. And this is the enzyme pyruvate carboxylase. And um, this enzyme is important for uh, many reasons. Number one, obviously it's important for gluconeogenesis, the synthesis of glucose from pyruvate. In fact, pyruvate is going to be um, the substrate for this enzyme. But also the fact that these, this type of carboxylase, this kind of reaction scheme is seen many times throughout biochemistry. There are many uh, carboxylases that use this mechanism. And what I've drawn here is I've drawn, um, I've drawn a biotin uh, molecule that has been ligated to a lysine residue. Well, where is the lysine residue? Well, the lysine residue is right here. Okay, what I'm circling right now, this is the lysine residue and the corresponding um, enzyme that it's attached to. In the context of this um, enzyme we're talking about, it's pyruvate carboxylase. But that's the lysine residue. And all this stuff over here, all this business that's on this side, on the left side, that's the actual biotin molecule itself. Okay, And... Um, the structure you're seeing um, right now, the, at least the, the critical part for the mechanism um, of the enzyme, I've circled in green. And from now on, when we actually look at the mechanism, that's what I'm going to draw is just that green part. Okay. Now, one thing that may be a little bit different um, from what you may be used to in your, um, in your textbook or, or whatever it is you're looking at is actually the enzyme, um, at least one of the proposed mechanisms has the uh, the biotin molecule, this functional part, held in this conformation or this um, this state in which the oxygen has a negative charge, and then you have this corresponding shift base right here. Okay, uh, this is going to be the the way that the enzyme functions. Okay, and we'll see that in the mechanism. Okay, but what's important to understand now is the part that's in purple. That's going to be our biotin component. And um, the blue part is just the enzyme itself. And specifically, this is the lysine residue. Here's your, your epsilon amine and, and so forth. Okay. Um, and like I mentioned before, this mechanism is seen many times throughout bi uh, biochemistry. And but while, we're, while we're on that topic, let's mention uh, several things that this type of enzyme uses. Number one, uh, its coenzyme is going to be biotin. Okay. And there also have to exist enzymes that biotinylate. Uh, the enzymes that, that do this. So, for instance, um, you have to biotinylate uh, pyruvate carboxylase for it to function. Without biotin, it's non-functional. Um, number two, the actual the, the carboxylation source, in other words, the source of carbon that we're adding to the substrate is, is from bicarbonate. Okay, it's from bicarbonate. And if you remember the structure of bicarbonate from your general chemistry, it looks like this. Okay. So that's bicarbonate. It's the conjugate base of carbonic acid, or we consider it the, uh, car uh, the conjugate acid of carbonate. And the other thing that this type of enzyme requires is ATP. So this is an ATP-dependent reaction. We'll look at how it uses that in a few minutes. But for now, um, what's important to realize is that all of these carboxylases that, it, that are like pyruvate carboxylase use these cofactors and coenzymes and so forth, okay? They're all biotin dependent, so, and they're all bicarbonate and ATP dependent. So if you see a biotin dependent carboxylase, they're also going to require bicarbonate and ATP. Okay, and also that this type of enzyme, okay, can be divided into two sequential steps, okay? The first step is going to be generation is going to be generation of carbon dioxide. And this is very strange because you would think that there'd be plenty of carbon dioxide floating around in the mitochondria where this enzyme occurs, okay? But in fact, you, this is actually an enzyme that directly synthesizes carbon dioxide for its own use, and we'll look at that in a few minutes, okay? And the second mechanistic step, or I shouldn't say mechanistic step, but, but the second overall step in this is actual um, the generation of the carboxylated product, okay? 
And another way of looking at this is you can, you can basically say the carboxylation. Okay, and the carboxylation that is done uses the carbon dioxide that's produced in the first set of steps. Okay, and actually in the first part of the mechanism of these carboxylases, this is going to be the step that actually uses ATP. Okay, so so point underscored at this point is that um, in purple here's the biotin, here's the lysine residue in blue. Now let's actually look at the mechanism of how this occurs. In, in another video, we'll actually look in more detail at gluconeogenesis. Okay, so this molecule right here, you'll recognize this as adenosine triphosphate. So again, here's the structure of ATP. Let's actually look at the mechanism now. Okay, so what I'm about to draw here is the structure of bicarbonate. Okay, and the active oxygen of bicarbonate is going to be one without the proton on it. And as we'll see later on, this proton right here, okay, is initially going to get lost into solution, but it's ultimately going to end up on the phosphate that comes off in the last step of this mechanism, okay? So um, without ado, let's look at this. So this oxygen right here is going to do a nucleophilic acyl substitution on this gamma phosphate. You generate a trigonal bipyramidal intermediate, then the electrons kick down to reform the pi bond, and you end up losing adenosine diphosphate. Okay, so in this step, adenosine diphosphate is going to be your leaving group, and so what you've effectively done is you've attached, you've now attached um, the phosphate to this one carbon fragment. Okay, um, and so you'll end up with this. I'm going to try to keep the colors constant here. Okay. Um, now, one thing you will notice at this point is that um, notice how this part of the molecule right here has lost its proton, this proton that's right there, right? Well, the reason it does that is because this part of the molecule right here has a pKa um, that's below that of water, so it ends up, um, it ends up donating the proton to some base. And then ultimately, when this phosphate right here comes off, it's going to abstract that proton again. So we'll sort of keep our eye on this proton right here, although it's not too important. Okay. Um, now what's going to happen is something really strange. It's that we're going to do that generation of carbon dioxide. So this lone pair right here, this lone pair is going to kick in right here to form a pi bond. And that's going to cause expulsion of the phosphate. And actually, in this mechanistic step, okay, this is where that phos, the, excuse me, that hydrogen proton actually comes in. So our leaving group should be this. Okay, our leaving group should be, and actually, let me let me keep the colors the same. Um, our leaving group in this case will be our phosphate. And remember that when we have free phosphate, it's going to exist with the proton. Okay, and that's just because. Um, we're looking at the pKa, okay, so it's going to exist like this, and then what that's going to do is that's going to give us carbon dioxide, okay, and this is not carbon dioxide as a waste product, okay, this is one case in which the carbon dioxide that's actually generated is going to be used by the mechanism of the enzyme, and that's a very strange thing. So what have we seen in this first step so far? Well, the first step is we're going to attach, we're going to ligate bicarbonate to the gamma phosphate of ATP with adenosine diphosphate as the leaving group. And in the process, because of pKa differentials, uh, excuse me, um, the proton gets lost um, into solution from this, um, this one carbon fragment with the phosphate attached. And as soon as um, carbon dioxide is formed and phosphate leaves, the phosphate then picks up this proton right here. Okay, And that's what we talked about being the first uh, overall step of, of pyruvate carboxylases mechanism, is you generate carbon dioxide using ATP. And in fact, um, this first part of the mechanism is the same for all biotin-dependent carboxylases. It's always going to exist like this. Okay, so you have initially two leaving groups. The first one's adenosine diphosphate, and then you have phosphate that leaves. Now, the, ca the carbon dioxide that's generated is going to be maintained by the enzyme. Okay, and we'll look at that now. Okay, let's come back over here. Okay, um, in this step, what's going to happen is um, the carbon dioxide is going to react with the biotin. Okay, so if we come back up here and look at our biotin, uh, remember I'm only going to draw the functional part. 
okay remember there's a carbon here here's our nitrogen okay and then this okay remember that of course the rest of the molecule exists but I'm only drawing the functional component okay so we have our carbon dioxide over here that gets in close proximity to the biotin now what's going to happen is this lone pair is going to reform a carbonyl here which forces the shift base to come out and attack the carbon dioxide carbon and so what you get is a carboxylated biotin okay so you get carboxylated biotin so what it's going to look like is this it's going to look like this and I'll go ahead and keep the colors the same so now what we have is we have in activated carbon dioxide so the whole purpose of attaching the carbon dioxide to the biotin is to activate it okay so now what we have is an activated carbon dioxide and now what we can do is we can do the last part of this mechanism so now we're actually going to attach the carbon dioxide or we can say the carboxyl group we're going to attach it to pyruvate okay so recall that the initial substrate for gluconeogenesis is pyruvate Okay, and that was that could have been produced by glycolysis but remember that we're reversing the process okay so let's come over here and look at the molecule pyruvate okay so remember pyruvate is termed an alpha keto acid but just remember that really it's not an alpha keto acid it's a carboxylate doesn't exist as an acid at physiological pH which is sort of a misnomer right what you have is a base in the active site of pyruvate carboxylase and the base is going to deprotonate here. Now, um, what's essentially going to happen here is you're going to have a type of tautomerization. Okay, it's a base catalyzed tautomerization. Okay, and when you deprotonate this the, this carbon right here, when you deprotonate it, these electrons will kick in here and form a an alkene, and then these electrons from the pi bond come out here and end up on the oxygen. So what you end up with is the enolate tautomer of pyruvate. Okay, and that's going to look like this. Okay. Now, um, the, the the pi electrons right here. Okay, these are going to act as a nucleophile. Okay. So now what we have, let's let's um, let me actually do this. Let me copy and paste this. So, Control C, Control V. Okay, so let's let's put this over here now. Okay, so what's going to happen is, oops, this is cool. It's the first time I ever used that. Use some technology. Anyways, um, these electrons that are on, oops, wrong tool. Um, brush. Okay, these electrons that are on this oxygen. Okay, it's going to reform the carbonyl because after all, remember, enolates are not very stable, right? So these electrons reform the carbonyl, and that forces um, these electrons to come and attack right there okay so they're going to attack that carboxyl carbon okay and what you're going to get is a nucleophilic acyl substitution mechanism so these electrons will kick up right there generating a tetrahedral intermediate then the electrons reform the carbonyl and biotin is expelled as the leaving group so then these electrons kick in here to reform the shift base and then these electrons kick up onto the oxygen okay so basically what you should get at the end okay is let's actually draw biotin coming back off so biotin should leave and I'm, again I'm just drawing the the functional part right so the biotin in this form should leave and then what you should up, end up with at the end is oxaloacetate okay so again Here's our pyruvate component. So this was the part that was pyruvate. Remember that we reformed this carbonyl right there. And here's this carbon. So if I label this carbon in purple right here, this carbon that I'm putting the dot on, that's this carbon right here. And then we're going to have, we're going to have the carboxyl group attached to that. So that means that this, this right here, this group right here, that's this right there okay so as we saw the, the the second overall step of pyruvate carboxylases mechanism is actually doing the biotin dependent carboxylation and in the case of pyruvate carboxylase it's carboxylating pyruvate okay and what you end up generating is oops what you end up generating is this which is oxalo 
ox, oops, oxaloacetate. Okay. And often that's abbreviated OAA. And by the way, this reaction that we're talking about occurs in the mitochondria. Okay. And so what we're, we're going to see in a later video is you're actually going to have to have some other mechanisms to get um, oxaloacetate out of the mitochondria. Because what we're going to find out is that there are no oxaloacetate transporters in the membrane of the mitochondria. So something else is going to have to happen to oxaloacetate. It won't just leave. Okay? So let's do a quick recap of this video. Okay, Remember that um, these biotin-dependent carboxylases not only are dependent on biotin, but they're also dependent on bicarbonate and ATP. And the overall steps of the mechanism are generation of carbon dioxide, um, which is sort of strange, right? Because normally we think of CO2 being generated as a waste product, but here it's actually being generated as part of the mechanism. It doesn't just use free CO2. And then you end up doing the carboxylation. Okay. So in the first step, we have this ATP molecule that's allowed into the active site. And um, using ATP, bicarbonate is phosphorylated. And remember that proton gets lost somewhere here in the mechanism. But ultimately, um, when CO2 is formed, it expels phosphate. And the phosphate leaves the active site with that proton. Right? So now we've generated this carbon dioxide right, that's going to be used by the rest of the mechanism. Okay. And in the rest of the mechanism, what you have is biotin attacks. It attacks the CO2, generating carboxybiotin. Okay, it generates carboxybiotin. And then what's going to happen is there's going to be a base catalyzed tautomerization of um, a base catalyzed tautomerization of um, pyruvate. And that's going to basically generate the tautomer of pyruvate. Specifically, it's the enolate version, right? And then instead of just doing a tautomerization, you're going to have that alkene come out and do a, a nucleophilic acyl substitution on this carboxyl group of biotin. And that forces biotin as the leaving group, and you end up generating oxaloacetate. Okay. Now, there is one other thing I do want to mention about this enzyme that's actually really cool. Um, is that notice here how um, there's this chain right here. I'm going to circle it. There's this chain right here that's a whole bunch of freely rotating carbons on the biotin, and you have sort of the same thing on the lysine residue to which it's attached. Well, one thing that's unique about these biotin-dependent enzymes is that um, you, what you actually have is, let, let, let's, say that, um, let's say that here's sort of the pivot point, right? And we'll put B for biotin. Here's the biotin molecule. And then we'll say that this over here, let's say this was mechanistic step one, right? That was our generation of carbon dioxide, right? Well, and then over here, we'll say this is in the active site where mechanistic step two occurs, right? What's actually going to happen is mechanistic step one occurs on a very different side of the enzyme active site than step two. And so what will happen is, once you generate the CO2, literally across these carbon atoms that are freely rotating, right, the, the biotin itself will actually physically rotate to where it's over here, right, to where it's over here, and then it will perform mechanistic step two. So actually what you have is sort of this tether, this tether that on one side um, it will do mechanistic step one, and then it will rotate over to another part of the active site and perform the second me mechanistic step. Okay, So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on pyruvate carboxylase. And just keep in mind that there are quite a few enzymes like this that have the exact same mechanism. In fact, um, there's another enzyme that you'll encounter in beta oxidation called propionyl-CoA carboxylase. And it, in fact, uses a mechanism, at least at least the first part of the mechanism right here, the generation of CO2, it's identical. Okay, so you will see this again. See you in the next video.